So here uh, is a uh, uh, algorithm that are taken from the DAS guideline. DAS is a difficult airway uh, society and also, uh, for this uh, trachea intubation of a critically ill uh, in adults. Okay, so uh, first we pre uh, after our planning, uh, our preparation, then we go into pre-oxygenate of and our checklist. Okay, position the head up. Okay, assess the airway, identify the critical thyroid membrane, uh, waveform capnograph if we have, okay, pre-oxygenate either using a face mask, uh, CPAP, NIV, oh, oh, sorry, and or even a nasal, uh, nasal cannula, okay, optimize the cardiovascular system and share the planning, okay, uh, not even failure, share our plan, what we're going to do, and if we fail, what is our backup plan? Okay, of course, if there's nothing much and uh, it's a smooth intubation, we succeed at the uh, first attempt, confirm with capnograph. Of course, uh, at this uh, time, uh, if the patient is COVID, uh, it's a bit hard to uh, auscultate the patient. Basically, we'll just look whether there's a chest rise, you know, look at the, whether the oxygen, the SPO2 are okay. So we will assume uh, we already intubated and also usually we intubate with our uh, video laryngoscope so we can very sure that we are in the uh, airway okay so if unfortunately we've failed our first time okay please call for help and also get a video laryngoscope if we haven't uh, used it before that and prepare for the front uh, front of neck uh, access Okay, then uh, declare for a uh, field intubation after the maximum of three attempts. Never try to uh, uh, intubate again and again and again because we can cause trauma, bleeding, and airway edema. Then after that, we cannot intubate the patient maybe. Okay, our plan B, plan C, this will be the rescue oxygenation, which we have the our uh, this uh, second generation supraglottic airway. And while waiting, if we haven't prepared for our supraglottic airway, then we need to uh, continue to oxygenate our patient. Okay, so you have to, uh, so we can uh, see from the beginning up to here, plan B, plan C, our rescue plan, maintain the oxygenation no matter what, okay? Even we have failed our intubation, but we need to maintain the oxygenation, okay? By using face mask or NIV or even the nasal uh, cannula. And if we have got our this uh, supraglottic airway, then uh, also maximum of three attempts. After the three attempts, we still unable to uh, ventilate the patient, we have to declare, can't intubate, can't oxygenate. Okay, but uh, if we're lucky enough, we're able to insert uh, our supraglottic airway, we have to stop, think, and communicate whether do we need to wait the patient, okay? Wait for our help, wait for our expert, our specialist, our consultant, or our more senior people, okay? Or shall we intubate via supraglottic airway or refer our ENT? if we are not comfortable on doing the front of neck uh, airway. Okay, so this will be our last choice, uh, the front of neck abscess, uh, uh, airway by using a scapel cricothyrotectomy. So this is also a guideline from uh, DAS for this uh, can't intubate, can't oxygenate in a critically ill patient. Okay. So uh, it's a scapel uh, cricothyrotectomy. The equipment required is a scapel, buji, and a smaller ETT, uh, usually cuff uh, uh, this uh, five to six uh, mm. Okay, so this is uh, how we do it. Uh, if we are not uh, trained or we're not uh, comfortable or we are not good in doing this uh, cricothyrotectomy, please do not do that refer to our ENT colleague or a person who is more experienced in doing all this uh, airway, okay? Do not try uh, attempt to do if we are not skillful, okay? It will cause more harm. 
So this is a picture that um, uh, how uh, this uh, front of neck access. Uh, so we identify where is a cricothyroid membrane, uh, put a scalpel. Then after that, uh, uh, initially it's a horizontal. After that, 90 degree and put in our buji. So the buji is from here then towards to the airway. And we rewrote our uh, ETT from the buji. Okay, uh, it looks simple, but it's not as simple when uh, during this uh, emergency situation. Okay. So there will be uh, another uh, this uh, uh, protocol uh, for tracheal intubation in an adult with uh, COVID-19. So it will be a bit different from uh, those uh, non-COVID patients. So uh, the principle is still the same, but just uh, here and there of uh, modification. Okay, for uh, personnel wise, must be the most experienced uh, uh, and one assistant PPE trained and the intubator have to be uh, have need to be the most senior and most skillful one. Okay, uh, history or uh, an examination very quick one and we have need to have a strategy and backup plan. And before we go into to intubate the patient, the intubator uh, and all the assistants need to be brief, know what to do before dawn and go in. Okay, so for all the intubation and after intubation is uh, more or less the same. Uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, for this uh, oxygenation may be a bit different because uh, if we want to avoid a back mass ventilation, uh, if can, okay, because uh, all this can cause this uh, 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 air aerosol generating, okay. Okay, mm. so after we have uh, successfully intubated the patient, uh, confirm the placement, either we see the uh, chest rise or scartation uh, by capnograph and hemodynamic wise, after a uh, patient has uh, received uh, adequate oxygenation, the SPO2, uh, SPO2 uh, will pick up. Uh, hopefully, but sometimes it's not true uh, in this uh, COVID patient where their lung is uh, very bad, okay? Then we uh, have to prepare sedative agent after we intubate them, uh, this uh, midazolam infusion or propofol infusion, and also not to forget our energy, yeah, either fentanyl or morphine, and connect to ventilator. Uh, I'm not going to touch more on this, uh, how we're going to ventilate the patient because there will be a big topic. Uh, of its own. Okay, after we have intubated and settled all these uh, uh, problem, documentation is very, very important because uh, what problem that we have we have faced during the intubation, for example, difficult intubation, what is a common left hand, okay, uh, what happened during our, the intubation, for example, the BP drop, we need to start our inotrope, we need to give resuscitation drugs, all these need to be documented now. And after documentation, we need to pass over, okay, because uh, we not 24 hours uh, in the hospital, uh, we need to pass over next day colleague that continue to follow up patient. And not only that, we need to pass over to the nurses, our ICU nurses or the ward nurses that taking care of the patient, okay? So uh, tell them what have we done and what to look for. Okay, and not to forget, check X-ray, ABG, and review again. So after we intubate, after our documentation pass over, we have ordered our chest X-ray, ABG, please review again the patient. If we can't go into the ward to review the patient, at least give a call. How's the patient? Why is the ABG? Chest X-ray have been done. Review the chest X-ray by ourselves. Okay. So I'll touch a bit on this uh, assessment of uh, airway, okay? So uh, it will be a bit difficult in uh, uh, this uh, emergency uh, airway to have a proper assessment of the patient. It needs to be uh, very uh, quick 
and a quick assessment of the patient, no matter it's a history of examination. Okay, so uh, indication of intubation, what is a pre-morbid, what is a comorbid, so we roughly know what is a physiological reserve in this patient, we, uh, and this can, uh, uh, we can adjust our uh, drugs, okay, and when is the last meal to uh, this uh, to avoid this uh, aspiration. So examination, of course, airway is the most important hemodynamically and investigation. Look at the blood investigation, uh, roughly know what is and the uh, function kidney, the uh, function of the liver also, and also look at the chest x-ray. So airway assessment uh, basically is to recognize a uh, difficult intubation, I mean difficult airway. But uh, it's a uh, full assessment is always uh, impractical, okay, particular in those uh, patients already abandoned or uncooperative the hypoxic patient. But clinical appearance will be quite useful. And if the patient able to open mouth and we can check the malapati, that will be uh, very useful. And there's a report from the uh, NAP4. Uh, NAP4 is this uh, national audit project uh, done in, uh, I think it's 2012 or 2015 from UK. Okay, NAP4 is uh, uh, about this uh, uh, intubation and airway management. Okay, so they have reported that in ICU and ED, they have frequently uh, uh, fail to assess the airway. And the most scary part is after we have identified the high risk patient and it's not follow appropriate airway strategy. Okay, so this thing to be highlighted. And when we recognize something uh, is not right, difficult airway, we have a proper plan, proper strategy, okay, to avoid uh, all the complications. So there is a scoring is called a Marco, Marco car score uh, to uh, calculate uh, the difficult intubation. Okay, so uh, there are a few factors. Okay, the related patient, the malapati score, whether the patient got sleep apnea, uh, cervical mobility, mouth opening, if patient able to, uh, still able to obey our command. Okay, so and this a point total of 12 marks. Okay, from 0 to 12, 0 of course is a very easy one, 12 will be very difficult. Just a scoring just to help us to uh, identify all these uh, difficult airway and intubation. Okay, so uh, as I say, uh, these, uh, during this uh, airway assessment have to be very quick. Actually, usually we can just have a quick glance on the patient generally like the build of the patient whether the patient is obese have this a uh, bull neck and a very large breast or maybe they have this uh, receding chin and very obvious problem uh, we can use this uh, mnemonic rats b is a burn radiotherapy marks especially over the neck region uh, patient have big abscess uh, no matter in the oral cavity or over the neck, okay, tumor, trauma, and scar, because all this can cause this uh, limited neck movement, okay, congenital or acquired abnormalities and poor dentition. So all this can just uh, uh, over the this uh, appearance of the patient. Okay, what the uh, congenital uh, or acquired problem the patient have like this uh, peer rubber syndrome, paper fell syndrome, and also Down syndrome. Okay, over here this uh, peer rubber syndrome, uh, peer robin syndrome, and this is uh, paper fell syndrome. And we, when we go to what as a refer case to intubate, when you see this patient with this kind of clinical features, then we definitely uh, we know this is definitely a difficult intubation. And those uh, uh, acquired one will be uh, this uh, cognitive tissue disorder, like patient having this uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, metabolic like obesity, or endocrine problem like acromegaly, Cushing disease, and or ENT problem, they have this uh, peri uh, peritonsillar abscess, intraoral mass, and uh, burn patient, uh, facial burn. Okay, this is a picture to show a uh, receding chin. Over the left side, you see, okay, this is a receding chin. Over the right will be a 
normal cheek. You can see, at least you see, we can see the angle. But over the left side, receding, you see, it's almost flattened. So in this receding chin, we will usually the uh, airway, the uh, vocal cord will be very anterior. Okay, uh, if the patient able to communicate with us, uh, still okay, then we can ask them to open mouth, uh, check the manapati, the tyromental distance and the neck mobility. Okay, malapati test we need to do in a neutral position if possible. If not, if patient lie down, we just do whatever we can for uh, this patient to assess their airway. Okay, open the mouth as wide as possible. Stick the tongue out without a phonation. Okay, so my, uh, class one will be, we can see everything, the heart palate, soft palate, uvula, and also the pillar. Okay, class two, maybe this uh, uvula will be obstructed a bit. Class three, we can just hardly see the palate, uh, the palate. and class four, can't see anything at all. So there's a, actually there's a relationship between the malapati classification, our common left hand classification. Okay, as uh, this uh, uh, picture explained. So this is uh, another picture. Okay, the A is a uh, class one, B, uh, B, oh, so C is class two, D, three, and E, class four. Can't see anything at all. Okay, so uh, this uh, is a picture that taken from a patient uh, after a verbal consent and patient uh, agreed. So this is a real patient of, uh, in our, my hospital. So this is a maximum uh, mouth opening of the patient. It can be done. And this patient is alert conscious and alert conscious and patient is sitting uh, upright neutral position. You see, it's common left hand for can't see anything at all. Then uh, second is a tyromatter distance. Ask the patient to extend head and neck as far as possible. Okay. And how to check the uh, neck mobility. Okay. Ask the patient to look up. But the patient have to fully extend the neck, look up without moving the shoulder. Okay. So how we check uh, is called one is this called a warning sign of a uh, daily can. Uh, we use our index finger of each hand, one under the chin, the other under the uh, this uh, inferior occipital prominence. Okay, is uh, okay. This is the picture. So here, how I uh, how we check the tyromental uh, tyro distance. Usually, three finger breath, uh, will approximately six centimeter, will be good enough. That means is uh, uh, can can uh, we can safely say that uh, this patient the airway should be okay. Okay, and this is uh, how we check the neck mobility. See, without moving the uh, shoulder, the shoulder is uh, stable. One hand over the chin, the other hand over the uh, this uh, uh, occipital prominence. Okay, so in the good neck movement, the chin will be higher than the uh, occipital prominence. Okay, this we consider a good airway. Okay, so uh, at the end of my uh, presentation, I will discuss a bit on uh, airway crisis that uh, no matter, uh, we will this uh, usually a uh, uh, counter lah, which uh, triggers to me, bleeding airway and upper airway obstruction. So uh, this uh, tracheostomy management, I also uh, take from this uh, DAS guideline. Um, okay, if patient dislodge tracheostomy, what to do is call for help. Okay, don't do it alone. Call for help. Okay, look, listen, and feel at the mouth at the tracheostomy because uh, if this uh, uh, tracheostomy is still very new and very fresh, that means within a week, of this uh, tracheostomy or trachea is just within a week. So uh, the tract is haven't properly formed. So if it is large, do not reinsert back because it can cause more trauma, bleeding. Okay, so always call for help. Call the ENT and call our senior. Okay, don't do it alone. And we have to look, listen and feel at the mouth and the tracheostomy side, see whether there is any uh, ventilation by the patient of its own. Okay, see whether patient is breathing or not. If patient is breathing, 
of course, it's good. We can put uh, the oxygen over the face and even the tracheostomy side. If the patient is not breathing, already collapsed, so now uh, we might uh, proceed for our intubation. Okay, so now we go into it. So we assess the tracheostomy patency. Okay, feel at the uh, stoma side. Eh? Okay. So remove uh, some of the patient, uh, like for example, the patient uh, is uh, old tracky, okay? And they have this uh, speaking valve or some inner cannula. Re uh, we can remove it, okay? If present, okay? After we remove it, maybe sometimes it's just a blockage over the inner tube or the speaking valve, okay? After we remove it, uh, we pass a suction catheter. If able to pass, means that the tube, the stoma site is uh, patent. Okay, so uh, if we are unable to uh, pass the suction catheter, uh, we can deflate the cuff, look, listen, and feel at the tracheostomy site. Okay, whether the uh, after we deflate the uh, tracheostomy cuff, if the patient improve or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, if the patient improve, the tracheostomy may be partially obstructed or displaced. Then we continue our ABCD, our airway breathing circulation assessment. Okay, so if patient not improve, okay, after we uh, remove the inner cannula, the cap, uh, we deflate the cuff, okay, so patient is not removed, remove the tracheostomy tube, okay. So sometimes uh, it's a blockage or sometimes it's just a, it just dislodged, okay. Mm. So now already uh, we have removed it. Uh, to feel whether uh, this patient uh, able to uh, ventilate after we remove the tracheostomy side, whether the stoma is patent or not. If the patient is not breathing, okay, no, not breathing. Uh, if patient already collapsed, of course, CPR the patient, okay. If the patient is uh, breathing, we can continue our ABCDE assessment. And... Uh, uh, during this uh, situation, we have must uh, this uh, prepare for our uh, intubation set. If we are unable to uh, uh, maintain the airway, okay. So uh, attempt to intubate the stoma either we uh, use a tracheostomy tube, the small one. Of course, we have to re of remember uh, this uh, is a fresh stoma. Don't do it, okay? If a uh, old stoma, that about more than one month, two months, uh, then we can reinsert the uh, trachea tube, okay? Then, uh, using a then when we intubate using a smaller ETT, okay? And remember, when we uh intubate this kind of patient, we have to uh, go in a bit deeper to pass through the stoma. Okay. Then the other issue will be breathing airway. Okay, so uh, usually uh, is uh, seen in this uh, post tonsillectomy uh, bleeding uh, or some dental surgery. So what we anticipate is uh, airway will be a difficult laryngoscope and cause and also the airway edema. Uh, that's why EDT size will be one size smaller and risk of aspiration, aspirate the blood and inadequate fasting time. And because of bleeding, patient will go into hypovolemia. Uh, is a uh, emergency situation also. So we need to assess and manage the patient simultaneously. Quick history and quick examination. So this actually is the uh, principle of us to manage an emergency uh, airway situation. Okay, quick history or the sequence event, look at the previous anesthetic drug. Okay, that's why documentation is very important. What drugs have given, what is the ATT site, uh, and the anesthetic technique and examination wise go for ABC airway uh, patency whether we can ventilate oxygenate the patient and circulation hemodynamic stability okay so to assess the degree of hypovolema yes usual respiratory rate heart rate CRT are uh, the uh, CRT pulse pressure blood pressure and also the mental status and we often uh, underestimate the blood loss because a lot of blood already swallowed to the stomach and mental status and because uh, sometimes uh, this uh, bleeding uh, it occur like 
two, three hours after the surgery. So they, they still have some residual anesthetic effect. Uh, first, when you come to uh, this patient uh, present to us, obtain the IV access if not done. Okay. Uh, when we have this uh, IV access, we take out the blood investigation, full blood count, PTI, PTT, RP, and GSM and start initial resuscitation, 20 mils per kg of crystal lot and KIV for pack cell infusion. Okay, so intraoperatively, continue to optimize the patient. Um, okay, still the same principle, who is a uh, person uh, that uh, in the team, our senior anesthetist, uh, ENT surgeon and skill assistant and drugs we use for uh, this uh, modified rapid sequence induction. And a bit special about this uh, bleeding airway, we need two uh, functional suction catheter because one in case one may block by the clots, okay? And airway, uh, two EDT also, one predicted one, the other one is a smaller one. They pre-oxygenate the patient. ENT surgeon must be scrubbed and prepare for tracheostomy if patient are if unable to intubate. Okay, after intubate, confirm the placement and not to forget IV dexa to reduce the airway edema. The other one is a, a upper airway obstruction. Uh, it usually is an END case, uh, or the parapharyngeal abscess, uh, retropharyngeal abscess. Okay, so uh uh, refer by ED, uh, usually it's share case for ENT. So patient will go with respiratory distress, fever, and septic looking. So after a brief history, uh, remove whatever uh, imaging that we have. So the issue will be difficult airway and inadequate fasting time. So faster arrange the OT for intubation, ABC approach, uh, face mask for oxygenation, adrenaline net, and not to forget IV line, glycopyrrolate, to uh, reduce the secretion. So go for OT, awake fiber optic. Our help will be senior consultant or specialist, then a uh, well-trained assistant. So drugs, uh, because of the awake fiber optic, we require this uh, TCI remifentanil or Prisidex, okay? And ENT standby for emergency tracheostomy. And post intubation, uh, ICU. Okay, so take home message will be uh, to call for help, plan, prepare, and prepare for complication of failure. Communication among the colleagues and other department, documentation, pass over, and also uh, they always have this uh, practical training and drills and protocols in uh, all uh, department and hospital. Okay, these are my references and special thank to my fellow MO, my MA and my uh, colleagues and my consultant uh, to help me in this uh, presentation. Okay, thanks. Uh, may Thank I you, invite uh, Dr. Tam again? Uh, because I think there's some interesting questions uh, that maybe we can just discuss uh, live prior to taking a break. Uh, Dr. Tam, this is a difficult question for you. Uh. So if we are in district setting and there's a patient who's obese, hyperkalemic and in shock and you need to intubate that person, uh, do you use saxometonium, muscle relaxants or how do you go about it? Tricky, eh? Okay, hi. Uh, I just answered the question uh, on YouTube. Like. Okay, so uh, district, of course, uh, is a very uh, challenging place uh, when we manage uh, this uh, obese and difficult patient, okay, because the resources is, uh, is very limited. Okay, so if uh, Saxa metonium is the only muscle relaxant that you have, I think it's... Uh, just use it, okay? Because uh, uh, I think because uh, this muscle relaxer actually will help to uh, improve the and smoothen the intubation. Imagine in a difficult patient, obese, the difficult airway, difficult when uh, even uh, want to hold mass, it's very hard for us, okay? And patient is struggle and the vocal cord is still moving. We can't, we can't put in the tube at all and we can cause more injury, okay? So for me, and the question also posted, the patient is in shock, hyperkalemia. So before I intubate the patient, of course, as that principle, we need to plan, we need to prepare and prepare for failure and complication. I will call for help early, uh, get my most... Uh, most uh, experienced assistant 
call for help, call for my senior, start I know trope for the shock. Uh, maybe I need to you know, uh, hydrate the patient a bit also, get adequate line. Then uh, my induction technique, uh, I will use a co-induction technique. Uh, that mean every drug I use a bit and a bit a bit. So can, I can use more drugs, patient can be more relaxed, less complication. Okay, for example, I'll use a bit of Mida, use a bit of ketamine, then use a bit of uh, propofol here and there a bit. So patient can get more relaxed, but less side effect from each drug. Then after the suck eating, then I'll... Um, actually, I like to use this, uh, this uh, lip looking spray lah, if your hospital is available. So uh, on the vocal cord, okay, before I put a tube in. Yeah, and prepare for the worst lah if we need to CPR the patient, okay? Oh, and also hypothesis, also I will place a lactic cocktail, I also be you know, ongoing lactic cocktail, this thing, uh, when I want to intubate the patient and prepare for the worst. Hey, can I add in? Yeah, of yeah, course. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, now with this COVID situation that we're having, uh, I think uh, most districts pun dah ada kan, high flow resa kanula kan? So part of, I think, if you have these cases uh, before you intubate in terms of pre-oxygenation, as you know, patients who are obese and they're in distress, septic, their reserves are very low. So the worry when you want to intubate this patient is uh, after you give muscle relaxant or even after you've induced patient to be more unconscious, they will desaturate straight away. Hmm. And uh, your ears, uh, you takut uh, because they will be then they glabah because of the sound of your SpO2. Mm -hmm. So part of the thing that you can actually do if that is because I, I'm looking at the situation. Our district sekarang dah kaya dah because at least high flow nasa kanula tu memang ada <laughs> with the distribution. So use that. Put that on the patient as your pre-oxygenation and as you oxygenate. Yeah? Uh, sorry, and as you intubate. Because this, because what we are talking here is about oxygenation. You maintain the patient oxygenation. And with that high flow that goes in, it will at least buy you time. So tak gelabah lah bila become susah, nak difficult, besar and everything. You have time and bunyi di satu situation tu akan slow sikit lah. Lambat sikit. So that reserve that you give and you maintain. So it's actually a good tool to use. Based on our current. If you are in certain district and dalam-dalam tak ada, yes. I, I think uh, that is the important thing is your planning. Alright, sorry ya, I campur-campur ni kejap. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> actually, uh, besides this uh, high flow nasal cannula, actually we can use a uh, normal nasal cannula also. Uh, give a high flow lah. So if the patient haven't like uh, induced yet, we can start with five liters. Then uh, on top of that with our face mask. Uh, the, then after that, when patient become unconscious, we can increase up to 15 liters. Yeah. If we really don't have the high flow nasal cannula lah. We can yes, use sorry. a normal, normal nasal cannula. Correct, even normal nasal cannula because there's a modification. If if anybody's hearing, you can go through the uh, I mean whatever YouTube resources. There's something that they actually put in the nasal cannula cut and actually put it by the nasal mm -hmm. that uh, basically in your pharynx inside and continue the infusion because uh, sorry the gas uh, flow because at the end of the day is that gas flow to the alveoli as much as possible for gas exchange and maintain oxygenation. Okay, thank you for the input. Uh, we have one question from our Zoom platform. How common is CPR in prone position? Uh, and if this does uh, occur, would you take the time to supine the patient or proceed with CPR? Any input? Okay, I put. Uh, I give my input first. Okay, in prone position, if uh, comfortable, comfortable, our CPR patient in prone, but depends that patient is very obese, we can't, you know, uh, very obese, difficult. So I will still uh, supine back the patient. Also depends uh, if I have a lot of uh, assistant with me, a lot of help, then we can supine. Of course, supine, I will be more familiar. Also depends on individual, whether you are trained or you are comfortable on doing uh, the procedure in prone position. If I really not comfortable, I will still uh, supply back, but my uh, help and assistant need to be around. I can't do it by myself. If I really by myself, I'm the first uh, attend, first person to attend, I will just CPR on the patient in prone. It can be done. Uh. Mm. Ah, yeah. Yes, agree with you. Because nowadays, when more and more patients are in prone position, we do see this. Like, it's not exactly uncommon, but yes, it depends on the situation. If you're alone, attending the patient first, 
go ahead while waiting for people to supine the patient because you you can't do it on your own. Yeah, mm-hmm. so um, I think uh, generally we can read about uh, how do we do CPI in prone position. There are some uh, articles online or so, but hopefully it doesn't happen to any one of us. Mm-hmm. Lah, eh? <laughs> 